Thank you, Betty. Good morning, everyone. Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and welcome to Palm West Community Church this morning on this beautiful day. Whether you are joining us in person or online, we are glad you are with us. And my name is Joe Place. I am the Minister of Music and Media here at Palm West. As we begin, we will highlight a few announcements. The Sunday morning Bible study taught by Bob Wilbur will begin next Sunday, September 4th at 8.30 a.m. in the Hoover Hall classroom. The class will be going through a series on the early church and all are welcome to join. A balancing and strengthening class will be held <laughs> Saturday, September 17th. Oh, you noticed my slide, okay, all right. A balancing and strengthening class will be held Saturday, September 17th at 10 a.m. in Hoover Hall. Please dress comfortably and wear supportive shoes. This is a great opportunity to improve your flexibility and agility. You might even be able to balance like that guy up there. <laughs> you can sign up today at member services, th actually through September 11th, or call the church office. If you'll take a look at the screen, you'll also see a list of events taking place this week, and you can find a printed list out in the, in the narthex. If you are our visitor this morning, we're so glad you're with us. Thank you for checking us out. And if you'd like to stop by uh, guest services, you'll find a gift get bag out there with our great appreciation. Thank you for wor worshiping with us today. Let us pray together. Dear God, your word is a light in the darkness and a source of great blessing. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us. Enliven our hearts and minds as we hear your word for us today and lift our songs of praise to you. Through Jesus Christ we pray, amen.
Please stand as you're able as we lift our praises to God. I give all my service. 
We're all a little bit confused this morning because normally the choir goes, and so we're changing things up here, which is always good. So good morning. If you don't know who I am, my name is Brian. Welcome to Palm West. And let me remind you, as I try to do every week, that you can continue to worship through giving. And there's two ways that you can do that. The first is online. And there's information on the screen behind me on what that looks like. And the second is the old-fashioned way, which is through the boxes that are located at our doors here in the sanctuary. This morning for our pastoral prayer, let me read this over us. It's from Psalm 102. It says, For my days disappear like smoke, and my bones burn like red-hot coals. My heart is sick, withered like grass, and I've lost my appetite. Because of my groaning, I am reduced to skin and bones. And those couple of verses by themselves aren't super encouraging, but I love them because they're real. And then we all have days where we feel crushed, we feel overwhelmed. But the way that that chapter ends, it ends like this. It says, long ago, you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever. They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them, but you are always the same. You will live forever. The children of your people will live in security. And why? Because of who God is and what he is like. And then it ends... Their children's children will thrive in your presence. And so this morning, I'm going to use what is my favorite prayer book. It's called Every Moment Holy, and it plays off of those couple of verses. And so this is part of a prayer for the feeling of our infirmities. And so won't you pray with me? Father, we know that we were not made for mortality, but for immortality. And so the faltering of our physical bodies repeatedly takes us by surprise. These aches and pains and our broken hearts are unwelcome evidences of our long exile from the garden. Even so, may the inescapable decline of our bodies here not be wasted. May it incline our hearts and souls toward you. And so while we rightly pray for relief and healing and sometimes receive the respite of such blessings, give us also the patience for the enduring of whatever hardships our journeys hold. For what we endure here in the deterioration of vitality and mobility and clarity is but our own small share of afraid creation. Yet we yearn for a promised restoration. Give us the humility, therefore, in our infirmities to ask and receive day by day your mercies as our needs require, where our dependence on others increase, let us receive their service as a grace. Let us trace in the hands of our caregivers the greater movement of your own hands, for you ever meet us and uphold us in our weakness. And in those moments when our bodies betray our trust, Work in us by our own hard experience a more active and Christ-like compassion for the suffering of others. And give us also a sense of humor to wink at our weaknesses now knowing that they are but the evidence of a perishable body. That you will at your beckoning rise again imperishable reminding us that this flesh and blood is soon to be transformed, redeemed, and remade. And so may the decline of our bodies incline our hearts and souls ever more vigorously toward your coming kingdom, O God. We pray these things in the name of our Jesus. Amen.
Thank you. That was beautiful. Well, good morning, everyone. Great to see you on this uh, lovely day. And we want to say hello as well to those of you that are watching us online. Uh, thank you for tuning in. And God bless you all as you join us in worship today. Uh, before I get into today's message, just want to give you a little update. Um, so as many of you are aware, our plans for some time have been to eventually start a more modern worship service over in Hoover Hall. And I'm going to say this again because some people still get it confused. We have no intention of eliminating our traditional worship service. We want to maintain and keep doing and actually build what we're doing right now. We want to continue to put an emphasis on our traditional worship service and try to continue to grow and to build that. We simply want to layer on and add a, uh, a, a more modern worship experience at Hoover Hall for some of the people who are more accustomed and would like a more contemporary worship experience. It's not that one is right and one is not right. It's not that one is better than the other. It's just that we have diverse styles of worship. And so as our vision is to do that, the whole key is, though, is finding the right person to help lead that. And a few weeks ago, we had Marcus Grisham come in, and was, I think most of you were very impressed by Marcus. And he had a lot of job offers, and so we wanted to give him time to process. Unfortunately, though, he uh, called and told me last week that he felt compelled to take a job in Wisconsin. And so he will not be coming here, which puts us back at sort of square one again. And so we're going to continue to go through, uh, you know, resumes, and we're going to wait until we find that God brings the right person to us. And so if that's in six weeks or if that's in six months, uh, we are not going to move forward on this until we feel like we have the right person who's going to allow us to put together the kind of um, modern worship experience that is going to connect with our demographic here in Sun City West. And so I just want to give you an update on that and continue to pray for our church and pray for this person that God's going to bring to us at some point in time. And uh, we're going to continue to stay patient with the process and we're going to continue to thrive in what we're doing right now, just even as we did this morning with our wonderful choir. Okay, so I just want to give you an update on that. Please continue to keep us in prayer for that. Today, though, we continue our sermon series entitled How To. And um, this is a series that's very practical. We're looking at some very practical ways in which uh, we carry out our Christian faith. And today we're going to talk about the subject of how to serve. Now, serving is a foundational principle of the spiritual journey. It was preached and it was practiced by Jesus himself, who we read in the Bible in Mark chapter 10, verse 43 and following, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. These are the words of Jesus. Speaking of himself, he said, I have not come to be served. I have not come out of a position of power to have people wait on me to open my car doors and do everything I want them to do to make my life better. But rather, Jesus said, I have come to serve. And so just as the King of glory, the very Son of God, a fully man and yet fully God, came and served in the flesh and blood on this earth, he calls us to do the same. A good example of this is found in the Gospel of Matthew, where we read about Jesus coming into the home uh, of Peter and his mother-in-law was sick. We read in Matthew chapter 8, when Jesus came into Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever, and he touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to wait on him. Now, this is interesting because in this particular story, Jesus goes into the home, and he sees Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and so Jesus reaches out, and he serves her, he touches her, and brings healing to her. But Peter's mother-in-law, once she is uh, healed, she immediately gets up and starts to serve back and say, what can I prepare for you? What can I do for you now, Jesus? Now, this is a very important principle because rather than saying, thank you, Jesus, for healing me, now can you do this, this, this for me? Out of gratitude for being healed, she gets up and begins to serve him. Do you see the difference between just receiving God's blessings and then saying, okay, God, now give me more and give me more and give me more. She takes and receives God's blessing and then she turns around and says, all right, now how can I serve you? Fundamentally, as Christians, we must ask ourselves the question, do we live a life of serve us or a life of service? 
Is my primary focus as a Christian about how the church, how my children, how my neighbors, how my community, how my government is going to serve me, or is it about how I am going to try to use my life and my talents and my abilities to serve other people? Because the message of Christianity is that all of us find ourselves at places and times where we need help. All of us find ourselves in situations where we have limitations and we may need the support or the help of somebody else to come alongside and to serve us or to help us for a season. But ultimately, like Peter's mother-in-law, even though we receive other people serving us, we are to turn that around and say, okay, God, now how do you want me to serve others? Rather than being a reservoir that just holds on to these blessings and and just keeps mounting them up, we are to be a river that we receive and then it flows through us out to others. And so rather than just saying, all right, God, what are you going to do for me? We should be asking ourselves, God, yes, I need you in my life and I'm going to ask you to do things for me, but what do you want me to do for others? This is a fundamental element of being a Christ follower, of being a Christian this principle of service. And while all of us have limitations, some of us have physical limitations, some of us have mental limitations, some of us have time limitations, even though we all have limitations, we are still called to be a servant to other people because Jesus did not come to be served, but he came to serve, and he tells us as his followers that we are to replicate and we are to model that to the world. So the question is, how do we serve? Let me just give you a few ways to consider as you think about how God wants us to serve him. First of all, we should serve serve with aptitude. Now, aptitude is defined as natural abilities. It is something that comes naturally to you, something that you can just naturally do. And all of us have natural aptitudes or natural abilities. And none of us have the exact same uh, aptitudes. We're all different human beings. Some people are talkers. Some people are thinkers. Some people are really great with people, but not so great with details. Other people are very good with details and specifics, but they're not always the most comfortable interacting with people. Some people can sing beautifully. Others can, let's just say, sing. (laughs) Some are artistic and creative others are very cerebral and detailed some are naturally organized they just see things and they just put things together other people are very comfortable with spontaneity and with messes some people are just by their nature incredibly generous they just give 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 All of us have our aptitudes. We have our strengths. Now, the problem with many of us is that we look at our life and we see what we cannot do rather than what we can do. We focus on what we want to do that we cannot do or what we once used to be able to do that we can no longer do. And we focus more on what we lack in aptitude rather than focusing upon what we do have available in aptitude. Now, all of these things, all of us have these things that come naturally to us. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, the Bible says, each one should use whatever gift they have received to what? To serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. Now, just look at this verse carefully. Everyone should take whatever gift they have received, whatever things that God has given to you. Some of you, God has given great resources. You have found great success in your life monetarily, or maybe you have received, um, uh, you've just been a very good steward of your resources, but you have received great resources. Some of you are very gifted with able to serve in different areas. Maybe you're very good with details or very good with people. Whatever gifts that God has given to you, whatever those things you have received, use those to serve other people. And notice the end of this, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. 
Because when we serve out of our aptitudes, when we take the things that God has done in our life, the things that God has given to us, and when we serve, we are actually conduits of God's grace. We are a means by which people are experiencing the grace and the love of God through us. And then it says in various forms. Why? Because all of us have these different giftings. All of us have different abilities or skills. And so when we are functioning out of our aptitudes, our strengths, our natural abilities, God is able to work through us to serve others. And what you may be very good at, I may not be very good at. You know, there are people that are just, they're always thinking about people. Like they're great at sending cards, right? That's not a strength of mine. There are people that when they go to Walmart or they go to Target to pick up something, they're walking to the aisles and they think about all this stuff that other people need. Oh, I should buy this for the church or buy this for the food bank or I have a neighbor who might be able to get this. Their mind just works that way. All of us have different aptitudes and gifts and we should administer God's grace through them. And when you do this, my friends, you're going to find a couple of things. First of all, you're going to find that when you are functioning and you are serving God and serving people through your aptitudes, you're going to probably do a better job. Because if you are naturally gifted at something, all right, you're going to do a better job than forcing yourself to do something you're not very gifted at. You're going to also find more enjoyment. And thirdly, you're probably going to see more fruit out of what you do. In the book of Job chapter 10 verse 8, it says, your hands have shaped me and you made me. We did this past, last spring. We did this whole series around this idea of shape. The fact that God has given all of us spiritual gifts. All of us have unique heartbeats or passions inside of us. We all have natural abilities. We have different personality types. And we all have amassed different experiences over the course of our lifetime. And God wants to use your shape, your experiences. You have certain experiences that the person sitting next to you does not have. You have painful experiences and you have positive experiences. But when we use our shape and we understand this is how God has made me, you can use that. God wants to work through that to serve other people. Now, even as I say this about aptitude, I have to also add this. Sometimes God will lead us and God will ask us to serve him in ways that go against our aptitudes. Moses, for example, when God called him, Moses says, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not a good speaker and I'm not a natural leader, but the Lord says, don't worry, Moses, I'm going to use you to make a difference. When God called Jeremiah, he said, Lord, I'm too young. I'm not fluent enough of speech. There's no way I can be a prophet, but he nonetheless was the one that God chose. Amos, who wrote a prophetic book in the Old Testament, was a shepherd. He was just a a small private farmer in the middle of nowhere that God began to speak to and told to write and to share as a prophet. Sometimes, my friends, God will ask us to do things that are outside of our comfort zone. And when he does this, it's usually for a specific reason, for a specific purpose. Maybe we're the only person that can meet that need at that particular time. Maybe God wants to use us for a specific way to bless that person. Or maybe God wants to show us that he's able to do things through our life that go beyond our natural abilities. When we serve within our aptitudes, we often feel in control of that because there are things that come naturally to us. But when God asks us to do things outside of our aptitude, we have to be very dependent upon him. And when God works to that, we often have this, this sense that says, you know what, God, this was you, not me. I don't, I, don't, I don't even understand how I was able to do that. So yes, sometimes God will lead through our weakness. Sometimes God will ask us to do things or prompt us to do things outside of our natural gifting. But as a general sense, when you understand your aptitudes and your strengths, you need to take those things and their various forms and use that to serve God other people second of all when we serve we should serve with awareness we should be aware of the needs around us aware of what God is doing aware of the opportunities aware of the people around us aware of how God may be leading us to step into something 
One of the more interesting phrases in the Gospels that we read is where Jesus is going around preaching and teaching, and we read, that, read this phrase, Jesus stopped. He is doing something, going about his business, preaching, teaching, uh, healing people, and the Bible says that Jesus stopped and then he would respond to a need or to someone or something. Jesus was not afraid to be interrupted. And he often was so aware of what was happening around him that he would stop what he was doing to be able to minister God's grace in his various forms as there was need. Let me just give you a good example from the book of Matthew chapter 9. Now if you have a Bible, turn to Matthew chapter 9. And I'm going to walk you through three, or actually four different verses in the chapter 9 of Matthew, four different verses where we read the very same phrase. And the phrase is, Jesus saw. Now, if you have a Bible and you have a pen, I want you to circle or highlight these words because we're going to see four different times where Jesus is aware. He sees something. And not only does he see something, but he sees something that many of the people around him are missing. Okay? So we begin in chapter number 9 of Matthew, verse number 2. Some men were brought to him, brought to him a paralyzed man lying on a mat. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. So once again, if you have a pen, circle the words Jesus saw. Now as they're bringing the man, everyone saw a paralyzed man. Everyone saw a paralytic who was coming to Jesus asking for help. But Jesus did not just see the paralytic man. The Bible says that Jesus saw their faith. He saw that they had faith to believe that he was able to do immeasurably more than they could even ask or, or think. And so Jesus responded, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And he healed the man. We go down a few verses later. As Jesus went on from there, this is verse number 9. As Jesus went on from there, after he healed the paralytic, he goes on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector booth. Follow me, said Jesus, and Matthew got up and followed him. Now, once again, you see the phrase in verse number 9, he saw. He saw a man named Matthew. He said, Matthew, follow me. Matthew was a tax collector. Everybody else saw Matthew, but you know what they saw? They saw a crook. They saw a person who couldn't be trusted. They saw a person they wanted to avoid. Tax collectors were seen as the bottom of the barrel. Tax collectors were seen as the lowest of the low. That's why we read the phrase oftentimes in the New Testament, sinners and tax collectors. And everybody saw a sinner, but Jesus looked at Matthew and Jesus saw there was something inside of his heart. Jesus saw potential. Jesus saw a person that was ripe for a life change. And so he sees something in Matthew that nobody else sees and Jesus says, follow me. And Matthew leaves behind his lucrative career as a tax collector and follows Jesus. We then continue in chapter 9. In verse number 22, Jesus leaves after an encounter with Matthew, has a gathering with some of his friends, and then the Bible says that Jesus is about teaching and preaching, and a woman reaches out and touches him. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 22, Jesus turned and he saw her, or saw the woman. He said, take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. And the woman was healed at that moment. Now here, Jesus is with a multitude of people. He's walking through a crowd of people. And all around him, people are touching him. People are trying to talk to him. People are trying to get his attention. But Jesus felt when someone touched him, he felt there was something different. We read that he felt the power leave him. And he turns and he sees this woman and he saw, sees her, identifies her and says, Woman, your faith has healed you. Once again, he is in a multitude of people. There's a mass of people, but he was able to see through the mass and see this particular woman that had a specific issue that she was embarrassed by. And there's a whole other story behind the story because this woman had an issue with bleeding that she could not get healed. And according to the Old Testament law, when you had an issue of blood, you were considered unclean and you could not touch anybody else. And so she was trying to very discreetly touch Jesus, believing that if she could just touch him, she could be healed. And she was doing it discreetly because she knew that she was unclean. 
And if she touched Jesus, she would make him unclean. But Jesus turns the woman, he sees her, and he says, woman, your faith has healed you. He saw something that everybody else in the crowd did not. Have you ever had the experience where maybe you've been in a crowd of people, maybe even in a church service, and there's hundreds of people in a church service, but God gives you a burden for a person? You see a person that maybe lost a spouse or a person who's sitting alone or a person who maybe somehow gets your attention in some way. Do not neglect those promptings. And then we continue down in Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. Now Jesus goes and he's teaching the large crowds and it says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Now there are many people who when they see a crowd, they see an opportunity. Many people are enamored by crowds. Politicians, actors, entertainers, even pastors or church people can be enamored by crowds. It's a chance for us to get adoration or attention, etc. But when Jesus saw the crowd, he did not see what can all these people do for me? How can I build my platform? How can I get something out of these people? When Jesus saw the crowd, he had an affinity. He had a love for them. And he said, these people need me. I don't need them. So he saw the crowd. He saw that he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. And here Jesus feeds the multitude. In verse 2, and verse 9, and verse 22, and verse 36, we see that Jesus saw. And Jesus saw something that was not evident to everybody else. Through the Holy Spirit, there was an awareness inside of him that he was able to see things that most were, were missing. And my friends, when we are called to be a servant of Christ, we must also serve God with awareness. We must be able to have our hearts and our minds open to see the needs of people around us. And that may be, my friends, that God may prompt you or lead you to see somebody. It may be a stranger in the grocery store. It may be a neighbor that you haven't talked to for several weeks. But through the Holy Spirit, God will prompt us to see needs that are easy for us and everyone else to meet. But if you are a Christian and the Holy Spirit resides in you, do not neglect those promptings because oftentimes when you have those promptings, God will prompt you to do something to minister to somebody in a specific way. Now let me say another element of this awareness piece. Awareness is not always seeing things or seeing the needs in other people that others may be missing. Sometimes an awareness is the discernment to be able to say no. Because all of us have had these experiences where other people are trying to pull us to do something for them. We have family who may be pulling us and say, you know what, I need you to do this for me. I need you to do that for me. And sometimes in our gut, we know these pulls that people are trying to pull us to serve them in some way that we don't always feel comfortable with. Have you, you know what I'm talking about, right? You sort of have that quenching, like, this just doesn't feel right. Well, let me tell you something. Even though Jesus was aware and he often stopped and he served people because he saw things that everyone else was missing, there were also times when people were calling Jesus to do something for them and Jesus said no. There's a story we read where the Bible says the people wanted Jesus to do miracles for them, but it says Jesus could no longer do miracles because of the lack of faith. They wanted a genie in a bottle. They did not want to serve. They just wanted to, they wanted this sort of magical incantation around them of Jesus to do these things to heal them. And Jesus saw through their facade and the Bible says he did not give into their pull. There's a story in Mark chapter 1 where Jesus wakes up early in the morning. He's preaching and teaching in a village. He gets up early. He goes out to pray. Peter and the other disciples find him. They said, Lord, where were you? 
The people want you to come back and minister more to them. And Jesus says, no, I must move forward and minister to other towns and villages. The people wanted Jesus to come back and spend more time. But Jesus discerned and said, no, I've got to go someplace else. There are other people and places I have to go serve. Here's what I'm saying. Being a servant does not mean that you have to give into the pull of every person who wants you to do something for them. Because sometimes people will pull you to do things for them that are unhealthy, that may be enabling their their maturity, that may be enabling their sin patterns, where they are simply trying to manipulate you. And as when we serve with awareness, we understand that sometimes God will prompt us, sometimes God will lead us to do things for people that we may not be seen in our natural strength, but also sometimes when we serve with awareness, we're able to say, you know what, I just cannot help you this time. Because there are times the most loving thing that we can do for somebody is to say no for them. Sometimes the best thing we can do is to say, you know what, I can't help you in this situation. Not because I'm being selfish or being a jerk, but because I just do not feel led to do so. And in many ways, sometimes we have to say no in order to help somebody else grow up and mature. So as we serve, we should serve with aptitude. We should serve with awareness. And finally, we should serve with a Christ-like attitude. In other words, my friends, it's not just what you do, it's how you do it. Because guess what? All of us have served God, and we've done so quite annoyed. Have you ever done a task that you know you should do, but you've got a bad attitude about it? Have you ever seen somebody who's doing the right thing, but they've got a really bad attitude about it, and you can see it a million miles away, right? Several years ago, I had a lady who called our church, and this was a single mom who was constantly having money problems, and she called up the church and said, Jim, can you help? Can you help with this or that, you know, and she was asking for help again, and uh, I was busy, and I was a little tired, and I quite annoyingly said, you know, okay, well, we can help you, but then I gave her like a little bit of a lecture. And a couple of days later, her sister called me up and she said, you know, Jim, you know, you talked to my sister a couple of days ago and she said, I just want you to know that what you said really hurt her. And, you know, and she said, you know, she sort of gave it back to me a little bit. And as I reflected upon it, I said, you know what, you're right. And I had to call the lady back who initially called for help. And I said, you know what, I need to apologize. I need to ask your forgiveness because when you called, um, I gave you a lecture that was probably a little bit over the top. It was more about me being frustrated than it really was about what she needed to hear. And my friends, sometimes we can serve, but our attitude can be sideways. Not just our attitude about specific tasks, but sometimes our attitude in general. But here's what Jesus, uh, we read about Jesus in John chapter 13. Jesus knew the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and that he was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was raped, draped around him. Now notice, first of all, we read in this verse that Jesus knew that all things were under his power. All things. Not just his small little kingdom, not his household. All things were under his power. And even though all things were under his power, he's the one who chooses to get up, kneels down, and begins to wash the feet of the disciples. Now, many of you are aware of this, but historically, in biblical times, people would wear sandals or their bare feet a lot, and they would have dirt in their feet. And so when you would go to someone's home and it was some kind of a gathering or a social gathering, they would wash feet. And generally, it was the job of a servant, in many cases, a slave or a child. 
It was generally the lowest person on the, on, the, on the totem pole. The person at the very bottom was the person who got the foot washing duties. It was not seen as a very noble task. But in this particular situation, Jesus, who has all things under his power, takes on the form of the lowest of the low. It was so shocking that Peter and the other disciples said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. This is beneath you. But Jesus insisted and did it anyway. In other words, when Jesus did these things, he was trying to show the disciples it's not just about doing the right things, it's having an attitude, it's a posture. It's not just about an isolated attitude because listen, some days we don't feel good. Some days we are tired. Some days we are agitated. We have these emotions inside of us. So all of us certain days will be asked to do things and our attitude may not be the way it should be. But Jesus, when he talked about attitude, it was not just those isolated incidences, those days where maybe we're not feeling good or maybe we've got an attitude about us. When that happens, we should own it. We should ask God to help change our attitude or we should repent and apologize for our bad attitude. But more than just isolated actions of service, watching our attitude, Jesus was trying to teach the people about a general attitude which says, listen, it's not all about you. We are just mere flesh and blood. As the Bible says in the book of Psalms, we are from the dust and the dust we shall return. We're just mere dust. And Jesus says, I want you to understand that regardless of how much money you make, Regardless of how many businesses you run or how important you may be, when it comes to serving God, you are to take on the posture of a servant. You're just a person. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 7, it says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Now notice that. Not to be used for his own advantage. In other words, I'm not trying to leverage all these people for my own benefit. But rather he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. My friends, God wants us to have an attitude of a servant where we realize I'm just a person. And my friends, all around us there are needs and there are opportunities. And when you are aware of your aptitudes and you're aware of your attitude and you are simply aware of the needs around us, God will lead you to do things. And it doesn't have to be super spiritual. And it doesn't have to be public. Some of the most powerful acts, I believe, of God's grace and God's love are things that are done in secret that are not seen by anybody but those receiving and the Lord himself. Whether it's offering a neighbor a ride or picking up groceries for someone who is sick or sending a card to somebody who might be lonely or a phone call to somebody who might need it. Whether it's choosing to go to the hospital and to spend 30 or 60 or a couple of hours of your time with someone in the hospital while a spouse is being operated on. Whether it's fixing a leaky faucet for somebody who needs a little help. My friends, we are called to be servants. And my friends, when we serve, we are representing Christ. We are being Christ to a lost, a broken world. And so I want to encourage you to keep serving. And as you serve, serve with aptitude. Serve with awareness. And serve with an attitude like Christ. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we get older, we become more aware of our limitations, more aware of our humanity. And I believe as we get older, we come to better understand certain things about the gospel that maybe when we were young and healthy were harder to grasp. One of them is the fact that we need others just as they need us. And so while each of us have our limitations, Lord Jesus, Help us to be cognizant. Help us to be mindful of the opportunities and the needs around us. Not afraid to say no if we don't feel led, but at the same time, Lord, help us to step in to serve others 
and in the process serve you, that we may minister your grace in its various forms to a hurting world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand as you're able and we'll respond to God's word together. starting to ramp up some of our Bible studies and different activities for the fall. And so um, uh, there's information about the Sunday school classes that will start again beginning next week with the Wilbers. And also on Wednesday at 1 o'clock, we're going to start having our, our midweek Bible study for the month of September. Jim uh, Kingsbury is going to be teaching on the Sermon on the Mount, and then I'll start a series on heaven in October. But that's 1 o'clock here in the sanctuary as well. So a lot of teaching opportunities, a lot of events coming up, so be sure you can go by our member service table and grab the different activities each week as you leave church to find out what's going on. And if you're a guest with us, be sure you drop by our guest services table uh, to get a gift from us and to learn more about our church. Thank you very much for worshiping today. Joe's going to give us our closing benediction and our closing uh, dismissal. Please join me as we share in the words of the Great Commission. As you go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And now go in peace and in love and serve the Lord. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all this day and forevermore. Amen.